Yes, yes, yes. Welcome. <laughs> it's Joe Clan from the compound here in the bowels of Long Island. I am psyched out of my tree to be here. Thanks to Anthony Kumir for having me here at the compound with the boys, with uh, Keith and Rat and Stinky and the whole gang. We got a few stories, a few silly things to do. And hopefully everybody's going to have a good time and I'll get to come back and do more and more and more and more. But of course, I am Jackie Martling and I tell jokes. So I'm going to give you a few jokes that are actually good enough for the Christmas table if you have a wild family. So this guy gets his mother-in-law's cemetery plot for Christmas. Then the next year he doesn't get her a gift. She says, why didn't you get me a gift this year? He says, you didn't use what I got you last year. <laughs> it's a little dark, a little fun. So, a guy comes home and his wife is naked on the living room floor next to a naked guy who's wearing a Santa Claus hat. He says, who the hell's that? She says, he came to the door collecting for charity and he asked me if I had anything that wasn't being used. <laughs> Hi, welcome. This, I'm on television. I'm so excited. You should see, I came here in a green sweater. And I completely disappeared because this is a this is one of those green screen places. So I completely disappeared, but I took it off, and now I have red, and I look like Santa Claus. Unfortunately, I'm not as fat as I used to be. Uh, I told the guys I had a, a good Christmas story to tell. This is a very sad story, but I told it with Ron and Fez, and they said you should tell Anthony and those guys that story because it's a great one. There was a comedian many, many moons ago named Mark Center. He worked mainly at the comic strip. A real nice guy, not a real good-looking guy. Very nervous, horrible on stage, really, really funny, but could not buy a laugh. He was so uncomfortable on stage. Nobody could, you, if you're not comfortable watching somebody on stage, it's hard to laugh at them. And I really loved him. So I used to book him at Governor's and I'd book him at the gigs I had on Long Island, but he'd do so badly that the owners would say, don't bring that guy back. We don't want to. So I'd have to wait a couple months before I brought him back so they'd forget about him. And then they'd go, we told you not to bring that guy because he wouldn't buy a laugh. Couldn't buy a laugh, but he was so great. And one Christmas, he got a job as a department store Santa Claus. And he was, he was going to be Santa Claus in a department store for two weeks. And he was walking around telling the other comics, it's nice to have something steady. <laughs> Which is just so sad. So Mark Center, wherever you are, he uh, he did away with himself uh, many years later, and uh, he was a good guy, and he was a nice guy. So welcome. This is fun. We gave out the phone number. Should we yell the phone number? It doesn't do any good. But uh, we tweeted the phone number. If you'd like to get jokes, at Jackie Martling, J-A-C-K-I-E-M-A-R-T-L-I-N-G. I tweet a joke every day at 4.20 p.m. International Marijuana Time, which is great fun. I'm the East Coast correspondent for the National Marijuana News. So we have a 4.20 joke daily. It's usually pretty filthy. Sometimes it's not quite as filthy. Now, I would like to tell these guys a story. I've never really shared this story on the air or on in print or anywhere they always made fun of me on this show that I used to be on because I claimed uh, some affiliation with the Roosevelt family. Now, this is a true story, and wherever you can look it up, my cousin is the town historian of Oyster Bay, John Hammond, and he is absolutely certain this is true. We have not been able to prove it yet, but we have the DNA kits, and if we ever get a Roosevelt that's in line in the lineage, We'll find out once and for all, because DNA doesn't lie. You know, either it lines up or it doesn't line up. But if it lines up, th there's no denying it. Theodore Roosevelt was born in 1858. His mother had a very difficult birth. That's on record. His father was nowhere to be found. Theodore Roosevelt's father was Theodore Roosevelt. Kind of weird. They called him Theo, and he did whatever he wanted. He was a very, very wealthy man. The Roosevelts were one of the five richest families in New York. Nobody was really aware of that because Theodore Roosevelt, he kind of played it down. But when Manhattan burned to the ground, Cornelius Roosevelt bought up as much of the property as he could. And of course, it's the world's greatest natural port. And they became gazillionaires. So Theodore Roosevelt's father was a philanthropist and a philanderer. He did what he wanted. But he started the Museum of Natural History. He started the Boy Scouts. He did so many wonderful, wonderful things. If you go to the Museum of Natural History, the whole first floor is Theodore Roosevelt. Him as governor, him as president, him as a, 
as a botanist and him as a hunter. And the front is a huge statue of Theodore Roosevelt on a horse with an Indian and a, you know, I mean, it's, it's almost dedicated to him because his father started it. But his father did what he wanted. So while Theodore Roosevelt was being born, his father was hunting in Maine. A year later, Franklin Hall was born. Franklin Hall, 20, 25 years later, wound up from somewhere in the middle of Maine, wound up in Oyster Bay, Oyster Bay, Long Island, and he ran Sagamore Hill for Theodore Roosevelt. He came from Maine and somehow wound up running Sagamore Hill. He had eight children. The oldest one was my grandmother. The youngest one was Leonard W. Hall, who was a, a congressman. He was the head of the National Republican uh, Party. He was the chairman for the National Republican Party in 1956. He was going to run for governor. But then some guy named Nelson Rockefeller came in and said, no, I want to be governor. And he was very rich, so he got to do what he wanted. When, when my uncle Len, my great uncle Len, was born, he, he coined I Like Ike. He got Eisenhower elected after Eisenhower had two major heart attacks in 1955. This guy did a lot of stuff. When he was born, Theodore Roosevelt's little daughter, Ethel, who became Ethel Roosevelt Derby, she named my, my uncle. I mean, there was a very close family because the theory is that Theodore Roosevelt, Roosevelt's father went to Maine, knocked up a woman, she had this son, Franklin Hall, and when he came to Oyster Bay, he was Theodore Roosevelt's illegitimate half-brother. His oldest daughter was my grandmother. So in theory, I have my great-great-grandfather is Theodore Roosevelt's father. Now, we can't prove it yet, but any Roosevelt in the chain, what we got to do is get a swipe of DNA, and we're going to know one way or another. So if you're a Roosevelt, what's that number? one 962 6846 If you're a Roosevelt in line from the Theodore Roosevelt chain, call us, one 962 6846 and we'll find out once and for all if I indeed am a Roosevelt, which I think is just so funny. It's just so goofy. And John Hammond, I hope you're listening. So where are we? What, what are we? Do we have calls at all? Uh, we've got one call that we could uh, start with. Now, how do I do this? Just put. So this you in. put that in, and uh, I'll go and press the on button for that call. Okay. Now I hope was that was easy to follow that story, right? I mean, true or not, it's it's followable. I have such tiny ears; it's hard for me. There we go. Okay. And... Whoa. Hello. Turn it down a little bit, Rod. I'm going to get blasted out of here. Hello, my friend. How are you, sir? I, sir, wow, that scares me. <laughs> so, so I don't really have. Hold on, hold on. My ears are too small to hold these things. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so I don't have anything funny, unfortunately. But back in the '90s, um, you used to put yourself out at the Rascals Comedy Club um, and put that out on cable access channel. I love Channel 3. It was so much fun. Right. Man, Rascals so, so, was the greatest comedy club. So I was probably a teenager in high school, you know, 10 o'clock at night, whatever it was. I would watch the show and I was, you know, learning all, all this nonsense. You're probably talking more than I need to know about life back then. But do you think that would ever happen now, even on pay-per-view? You know, everybody has a podcast. Everybody has a show. But no one does like a live I would love to, you if I to told say, you, you know? how hard it was to do what I did back then, I was on the Stern Show five, right. day, five hours a day, five days a week. We were also on television. And at the same time, I was doing that, that TV show and I was doing it for so little money that the only thing I really got out of it was they videotaped every show. So right. I wanted to do a different monologue every week. And for, for 52 weeks... I did a different seven minutes of dirty jokes every week. And I can still remember driving along in my car. It was like when you had finals to study for in college. Like there was no escaping it. And I'd learn and, and I never screwed up. And I did joke after joke after joke after joke. And it was so much fun. And it was live. And people, people used to say how much they loved it. Because it was almost like cable TV. You know, it was cable TV. But it wasn't dirty, dirty. But it was kind of right, right. dirty. And right. they let me play Stump the Joke Man. 
every week, and that was part of my deal. They videotaped that. I have so much tape. Of course, it's it's three quarter inch video, so you got to find Adam and Eve to to, to play it back. <laughs> but, but it was but, so but much that, fun. But it, I, I think that would I think that would sail nowadays as a show. I, I'm telling you, I, I don't get to. I, I work nights, so I don't get to go out and see many shows. Unfortunately, I, I do as much as I can to stay current and you know get to see stuff. But I would sit home and pay you know ten dollars for whatever, whatever pay-per-view fee to watch a live comedy show. Right, and, it, and it's like the flying Melendez because if somebody screwed up, and I used to do <laughs> Stump the Joke Man, and so many wild things happen, and the girls on stage, and it was great. That's a great, great idea, and I, you know, just, uh, you know it looks like we got the technology to do it now, don't we, Keith? Yeah, yeah, Stinky. You do it right there in that room. Stinky. But, but it, just, it was just a good time. And I, and Hold I on, I want to watch Rat that. Eat Popcorn. He, you know, he, you know, he has not shared any of his popcorn with me. My favorite thing in the world is popcorn. And you, no, 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 you shove it up your ass. So, yes, my friend, starting tomorrow night live, joke land from the compound. We'll be doing stand up comedy and stump the joke man, and we got dancing girls. You name it. We're, we're I just taking over. Go back down memory lane. So, thank you for the call. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. For, and if you want to get a joke. Uh, I Follow me on Twitter gotcha. at Jackie Martling. That's all I can do for now. But that's, you know, I love that. Yeah, well, you know I'm what I meant to announce, it. too? I am officially done with uh, that former network of mine, and I am hard at work <laughs> on my agent. book. My book is going to be out hopefully in six months. And I'm telling you, between growing up on Long Island and Michigan State and playing music and doing comedy and being on the radio, it's going to be a great book. And ev- well, maybe not everybody, but just about everybody's going <laughs> to. <laughs> <laughs> really enjoy it. You know, I I was thinking of a name for it. Tell me if this is any good. F unfair. And that's fun fair. Fun fair. F unfair. And I'm not just kidding. I just like to play with words. You know what? I keep seeing Merry Christmas everywhere. And everywhere you see Merry Christmas and lights, there's always lights burn out. And I haven't done it yet, but I wonder how many different things you could spell by taking letters out of Merry Christmas. You know, like like... My Christmas. That's one of them. You know, my Christmas. I know, I'm, I'm sure there's some kind of slanderous thing we could write. And don't do it automatically. Look at you. The rat man's over there doing it automatically. He's going to put it in his, in his computer. Look, you did it. Oh, people have done it already. No, I'm not talking. No, see, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about they have to be in line. You know, I was in, I was, I was, this, is, this is one of my bad stories. I was in Nashville. And there was a, a hotel when I was working at Zany's in Nashville in like 1983, and I was driving along, and the name of the hotel was the Sammy Davis Ho- the Sam Davis Hotel. It had nothing to do with Sammy Davis Jr. It said Sam Davis Hotel, and the eye was out, <laughs> which is just hysterical. I said, "Do you understand that Sammy Davis Jr. has one eye, and the eye is out on Sam Davis?" And I don't know whoever I was with was like, "What the hell are you talking about?" I said, "Never mind. It's just..." Fucking funny. Sorry. <laughs> Where were we? Buy my book. It ain't out yet, but it's going to be great. And we're going to prove that Theodore Roosevelt story. We got another phone call? Anybody calling in? We got nobody. What would you like to hear? What would you like to hear? I want to know what was your favorite uh, stump, your joke stump? Like who stumped you the best? There were a couple of horrible stories. Uh, I used to have joke man license plates, right? My wife eventually made me get rid of them because, you know, uh, you know, people like to fart around. But I was doing a show at the Upper Deck for Jim Bellazzo a million years ago. And I was playing Stump the Joke Man. And some guy way in the back of the bar stood up and said, where's your license plate? And I, and I thought it was some kind of trick joke. And I said, I don't know. And he held it up and said, it's right here. And he, and he ran out of the bar and he had my license plate. And it was stolen off the car. And then a couple of months later, somebody said they were in a bar and they saw the license plate up behind the, up behind the bar at some dive bar in Jersey. Another great one, we used to have Nutrisystem on the show. And they paid me money to lose weight. So I lost weight from like, you know, 200 to 170 and 190 to 165. I did it two or three times and it was really hysterical. And uh, I was doing Cl- Club Binet just got wrecked. I heard that they demolished Club Binet in, in Sayreville, New Jersey. It was one of the great places of all time. You know, they paid you in fives and tens and twenties and they fed you a bad piece of chicken. And, you know, me and Howard and Gary and Fred actually did a strip show, a male strip show there a couple times. 
you know, it, it just was great. It was like 700 people packed in and it was just the, the ideal comedy club. And I had been up and down and up and, and I'm sitting there. I mean, I'm standing there playing Stump the Joke Man and I'll never forget that some guy way back in the corner said, I got one. And I said, all right, what's your joke? He says, what goes down but always comes back up? And I, I'm like, this is like a kid's joke. I should know this. And I, I finally gave up and he said, you're fucking wait. <laughs> And the audience went batshit. They went batshit. Another great one. Oh, I'm not going to remember the guy's name. There was a New York Yankee that got in trouble for being with the under, underage girl. What was that guy's name? Anthony Cumia. <laughs> some New York Yankee got in trouble, and uh, and some guy stumped me. He came up and said, uh, "What well, do you guys?" It's uh, so long ago. It's like 25 years ago. Chad Curtis. No, shoot. Ah, uh, oh crap! But he says, you know, Al Hall. I don't know. I'm going to call him Harry Smith. But okay. the guy came up and said, uh, <laughs> um, "How's Harry Smith like the tortoise?" <laughs> and I, I, I had never heard the joke before, and the answer was, "He got there before the hare." <laughs> <laughs> and and that's one of the ones that went out live on the Rascals Comedy Club. Uh, on Channel 3, that was a great one. Rob Pern and the gang, what a fun, fun time that was. Stump the Joke Man is always, always fun. There's another, there's another call if you want to take the mouse to your right. To the right. Right here? On the, and then you see the screen to your, all the way to your right. Garrett will show you where. Where do I click? Over here? There you go. Garrett's got it. Yep. Did he click? That simple, huh? Uh, Hello? Scott? Yeah, what's up, my man? Did I do that myself? You did that My grandmother would say, I'm so modern. Hello, Scott. And you're from Garden City? Franklin Square. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, Franklin Square, right next to her. My right grandmother was from Mineola, so I'm being modern right next to my grandmother. How you doing, Scott? Nice to see you. Man, it is such a pleasure to talk with you, sir. And I didn't Hold realize- on, hold on. Did you guys set this up, this sir stuff? Nobody <laughs> calls me sir. That is, you know what that means. Go ahead, say it. No, sir. It means I'm old, yeah. <laughs> you know what? I'll tell you something that really gets me crazy is people come up and say, uh, you look great. You look great. You look great. And I lost a lot of weight, and I really do look younger than my years, but, but people say you look great. And I would be fine with that, except when I was a little kid. I'm telling you, I've remembered every joke I've ever read, ever heard, dirty, clean. That's my hell. I don't know anything but jokes, but I know all the jokes. And when I was a little kid, I read this joke. I didn't understand it. And it was in like Boy's Life or something. And it said, there are three stages of man. Youth, middle age, and you look good. <laughs> so every time somebody says you look good, I'm like, all right, that's the next step before he was a nice man. He's dead, you know. Did you ever hear that story? The, the two guys standing at the guy's wake? And one guy's looking at the guy in the casket, and he says, you know, when I die, I want people to say he was a good guy, a nice guy, a, a family man, a, a great person. And the other guy says, at my wake, I want somebody to say, I think I saw him move. <laughs> 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 all right, I'm sorry, Scott. I'm talking right through your time here. I mean, it's, it's all good, man. But, uh, I, just I want to, to tell you something, Scott. <laughs> they got my Jokeland logo with the big colorful letters and me in a red shirt and my hair's combed and I look good and I haven't looked up once. Are you noticing that? Are you guys noticing that? I have not looked up. I've been a professional looking right at the camera. You see these guys doing news on the air and they're always looking down and reading the teleprompter. They think we don't know. Of course you know. You know Johnny Carson used to do his monologue and if you didn't notice, you wouldn't know it. But once you found out, the cue cards... In the line, right? We're in line in, in front of the first row of people. So if you follow his monologue, if you tuned in, you could almost tell where he was in the monologue by whether he was looking here, 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 here. Yeah, just, yeah, and I never knew that. And now I know. You know. All right, Scott, it's your turn. That's right. I'm looking for the edit button, but unfortunately, I'm not in studio. It's not in studio right now. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's neither here nor there. But uh, Listen, I just wanted to say, man, I didn't realize what a huge part you were of the Stern show until you left, man, because I'm going... What happened to the comedy? The Stern Show is almost unlistenable now. And, that, that's very uh, flattering. That's very not flattering. Not for, for real, because I realized most of the shit that was funny was coming out of your mouth. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the truth is that's not true, but it's very flattering to say that. But I think, 
You know, it's very hard to talk about it without sounding pompous, but I no, think no, I brought absolutely. a little bit of a spark and made, if you're around for, you guys know, if you're with funny people, you're funnier. Like, like I'm sure you guys sit here with Anthony. You guys have a great time. If, if you guys go out and you're sitting with three of your friends, it might be fun, but it, it's not the same as people. And we had such an electric thing going on, you know, and people used to say, oh, you can always tell when Jackie wrote a joke because he laughed so hard. And that wasn't true. The truth is, <clears throat> I laugh. I, I, I'm sorry if I'm being redundant. I don't know if me and Anthony talk about this, but I laugh according to how, how funny something is. Like Robin's on there with Howard, and if he says, Robin, it's raining outside, she goes, <laughs> Robin, I just tied my shoes. <laughs> you know, it's the same laugh. It's very important. It's Abbott and Costello. She's very important to him. But I would laugh in accordance to how funny something was. Now, if I wrote something, I usually wrote it because I thought it was funny. I passed it to him, and I would howl. But if Fred passed something to me, I'd hand it to Howard. And if it was funny, I'd howl at that. Or if Howard said something on his own, I would howl at that. I, there was so many times I went home and my ex-wife, Nancy, would say, you know what was the funniest thing on the show today? When you wrote such and such. And I'd say, Fred wrote that. And she'd go, but you laugh so hard. But you know, yeah, I laugh so hard because it was so funny. She'll say, you know what was the funniest thing on the show today? I'll say, Howard said that on his own. But you laugh so hard. I'd say, yeah, I laugh in accordance to how funny something is. And it was, you know, and the laughter is so much fun. And, and it was all the goofy, you know, Fred and Gary and Robin didn't want me back on that show because they've been on vacation since I left. You know, I broke their balls. You know, like Gary come in and talk to Howard and he turned to walk out of the room and I just turned to Howard and say, look at his ass. And we'd be off to the races for 35 minutes, you know, breaking his balls. And it was, it was just fun, you know. Yeah, well, well, fellas, how about this? Benji Bronk, what the fuck does he do? Because I like to run a joke audit on that motherfucker and say, what is he doing? I'll tell you what he does. I, you want to know exactly what he does? I'd like to know, yeah. He, I'm curious. He, uh, he convinced Jackie to leave. <laughs> I no, sat no. there. I sat there and wrote jokes. <clears throat> Fred wrote jokes and passed them to me, and I'd decide between me and Fred. And Fred played the sound effects, and Robin did the news, and, and Howard did the show, and Gary was in and out, and Stuttering John was in and out. It was the perfect balance. It was the greatest show on earth. And all of a sudden, one day, they too. sat Benji Bronk next to me. Nothing against him. It's not, you know, everybody wants to get ahead. They, he oh, no, sat no. next to me. So now I had him writing jokes, me writing jokes, and Fred. So I had to sit there and balance. And I didn't have hardly enough room for me. And they put him next to me almost to say, Jack, if you leave, don't worry. We got it covered. You know, fuck exactly. you. And then I, that's why I just said, you know what? I'm setting my price, and if they don't meet it, I'm out of here because it was it was downright insulting. Imagine if somebody came to Robin and said, All right, I'm going to sit there and say, why don't you do this news show? Why don't you do this news story, rather? Why don't you do this? She had it covered. Hey, Fred, why don't you play this sound effect? He had it covered. It, the show was a perfect balance. You know, what are you going to do? Put somebody in the shortstop, you know, next to Jeter and say, let me catch a few of them? Fuck that. So that was my answer. The truth of it is, though... Benji is very, very funny. You know, sometimes I come home and Nancy say the funniest thing you wrote is such and such. And fucking Benji wrote that. So, really? so I got to give him his due. He's a, he's a real nice guy, and I always got along with him. But the situation was weird. But thank you for your nice words. I appreciate it. No, no, no. But it got, it got to such a point where for the last, like, 12 years, Stern has been so unfunny that I actually became an ONA fan. And I fucking refuse to be one of those. But I am one now. <laughs> Well, that's good news, and uh, O and A have always been so good to me, both of them, and uh, you know Opie and Anthony and uh, Ron and Fez, the, uh, you know, and, and uh, Jim Kerr on Q one hundred and four, and Mark Simone, because I I've always been nice to people, and they're nice to me back. You know, Howard gave me a pretty bad reputation for being angry, mean, fat. The worst one was it was calling me cheap. You know, I'd have the entire stern gang to my house and serve 200 lobsters and then he'd go on the air and tell everybody i was cheap and to this day people come up to me in a bar and say jackie you want a heineken i know you're not going to buy me one you cheap fuck and i'm like ease and my friends my friends thought that was the greatest because yeah, they know that they know that i'm generous you i know? brought you two cups of coffee you didn't give me fucking shit oh jesus now i got a question <laughs> a guy brought me flowers yesterday from my mother-in-law and he kind of ran out of there quick and i turned to emily and i said uh, well, he, he left too fast, but what's polite? I should have given him 10 bucks, right? Or 20 bucks. In, at Christmas, you tip, tip everybody, right? Oh, I'm the worst at tipping. Don't ask me. Oh, what do you bastard. think? Am I a cheap bastard for not giving him No, money? Rat's a cheap bastard. But if somebody just an unannounced comes to your house with flowers, what's... what's yeah, I think you give him a couple bucks. All right. Well, listen, uh, uh, f Funky Flowers in, in Huntington, come back to my house and I'll give, you, I'll give you a joint and I'll give you 20 bucks and a hand job. That's my final offer. 
<laughs> I got to go get some flowers. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Scott, I really appreciate your phone call, man. Cool. I, I think he's gone. Whoa, that son of a bitch. Yeah. You want to take a look at some of your uh, notes uh, from the years? I would love that. I would love that. This, th- this note is one of my favorite things in the world. I uh, worked on the Stern Show for 15 years. I worked for free for the first three years. From 83 to 86, I worked for free. And slowly but surely would write down little ideas and pass them to Howard. And eventually when we went to mornings, he said, all right, I want you to come in and do your thing with the notes and sit there. And in 15 years of passing notes, and I have them all, everything he ever said, I have all the notes in my mother's attic. That's going to be... That's going to be a show for the ages. But out of all the notes, there was only one note that I had hanging over my desk, and that's the note that's up there right now. I went to take a leak at, Chris, at Easter time, and I'm standing there taking a leak, and you know when you sense there's somebody else there, and I turn and I look down, <laughs> and here's this midget in a pink bunny outfit taking a leak, and he's bombed. And we went back in. It was the first day that Hank the Angry Dwarf came on the radio show. And we went in there, and he was bombed out of his shorts, and he was wearing a pink bunny outfit. And I used to, every once in a while during the show, this was a running thing that I created where if you're just tuning in, and I'd give like a stupid recap if we were doing something stupid. And if you're just tuning in, we're giving a breathalyzer test to a dwarf in a pink bunny costume. And I thought, if that doesn't sum up this show in one, one fell swoop. So that was, that was the first. Uh, and I loved Hank. And Hank died right after I left. And, and you know, and I couldn't go to the funeral because I felt like it, it, it'd be like, you know, like self-aggrandizing, like because I hadn't seen anybody or been part of it. It was kind of weird, but I really liked him. He was, he was funny and crazy. And oh, he, was a, he, was a, he was a thespian. He was an actor. And he was, uh, he was so fun. Speaking of thespians... There's a movie coming out in the summer called Disco. My friend Fred Carpenter's doing it, and I have a nice role in it, and my girlfriend Emily Connor's going to be in it, and hopefully Randy from The Village People, and a bunch of people, and it's a great, great, uh, great movie. And I'm, I'm finally, I think I'm going to have four words in this one. Usually have, it's so funny, I did a, I did a movie called uh, White Irish Drinkers, which is like a triple oxymoron. And I said to everybody, hey, you got to come to this movie. I got five words. I got five words. And we went to the movie and it turned out I had six words. It was like, instead of what are you assholes doing? It was, what are you assholes doing here? I was like, wow, yeah, all right. My role's expanding. It's always funny when I'm in a movie because I always have a teeny, teeny, teeny role. And all of a sudden in the middle of the movie, you hear somebody go, was that Jackie? Because <laughs> I'm never recognizable because I'm fat, I'm skinny. Where were we? What's this? This, we had Geraldo, now I got in trouble for this. I used to write notes like crazy and we never got introduced to the guest unless, unless the guest came on a bunch of times. It was really funny because this happened a few times where we'd have a guest on and the guest would be so concentrated on Howard that he'd never say that's Jackie, that's Fred or introduce anybody and the people were like kind of, deer in the headlights because they didn't know what was really going to happen so it wouldn't get really introduced and I always would have John or Steve Grillo or Gange or somebody get the information from the from the guest and like this happened with maybe five or ten of the guests where I sent them all my CDs or joke books or all my crap I would send to them and this happened with Clarence Clemens, Roger Daltrey, Diamond Dave, Joe Walsh. When they came back on the show, three months later, six months later, a year later, when they came in, they would forget that they didn't know me because <laughs> they'd never been introduced to me, but they had all my crap. And they'd come in and say, hello, Howard, hello, Robin, hello, Jackie. And it was funny every time. And nobody ever knew that. So uh, at one point, I said to uh, Steve Grillo, and we wound up getting in trouble. He, Howard yelled at us for like four days. I said, Grillo, I'm going to give you the funniest joke I write about each person. And I want you to get it autographed. And I have like a hundred of these signed notes. And it's the most eclectic. You could not pick out an eclectic group like this. John Wayne Bobbitt, Kenneth Keith Collenbach, Adam West, Barbara Streisand's sister, Geraldo Rivera, John Phillips, a Tiny Tim, uh, uh, Al Michaels. I mean, they're from every 
and they're all signed by them. And this, the one we were just looking at was Geraldo Rivera had just gotten his own show on CNBC. And Howard said, your own show on CNBC, wouldn't it be more profitable to have a lemonade stand? And of course the place went berserk. And, uh, and then Geraldo signed uh, This Shit Ain't Funny, which is, which is really fun. And he, he was a real nice guy. I did a show a couple times. He wound up being a pal. But at first, you know, I didn't know any of these people. So that was groovy. It was groovy. What do we got? Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim was such a, he was so exactly, he was exactly who he was. I mean, you couldn't invent the character that Herbert, whatever his last name was. He drank like a fish and he smelled and he was a delightful guy. Hello, Mr. Fred. Hello, Mr. Jackie. Thank you. Oh, 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 thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackie. Thank you, Mr. Fred. And he was such a character, but he stunk. So this was, uh, as a tribute to our reunion, Tiny Tim is wearing the exact same outfit he wore five years ago at our last meeting. And, and you know what? I really think he might have not only had on the same outfit, but he might have had it on since then. <laughs> he was great. I loved him. He was spectacular. Spectacular. Oh, and James, did, did I tell my James Brown story to Anthony? I don't think so. About the Viagra? Now I'm interested. James Brown came on the show. He was older. It was, uh, you know, years before he died, but he was, it was the old version, James Brown. He had some young girl, some young white girl that he was promoting. I think she had been a backup singer. I'm, I'm sure he wished up on her, but who knows, whatever. And it was so funny because we used to have a band called The Losers. And... You know, we had the premise, Howard had the premise that why do these people have bands? Why does Keanu Reeves got a band? Why does this guy from the Buffalo Bills have a band? They got a job. Why do the hell do they got to have a band? So we got the bright idea, we're going to have a band. So Howard played keyboards, Fred played guitar, I played bass, Scott Salem played drums. And we were horrible, horrible. And we're called the losers. And we were going to play a song with James Brown, which we wound up doing, which was phenomenal. Gary Delabati hadn't played the trumpet since second grade, and he brought his trumpet with him. And there's nothing funnier than seeing those lips of, of Baba Bowie wrapped around the poor trumpet. I thought the trumpet was going to disappear. It was, it was so hysterical. But that's not the story. James Brown's on the show, and we go to commercial. And he turns, I'm sure I told Anthony the story, but it's so good. It, it is. It's all right to repeat it. He turns, he says, Howard, did you ever try this Viagra? And I, I heard that. And I said, Howard, Howard. And he said, hold on. And, and Howard's like, what do you want, you asshole? Because he's talking to James Brown. I said, you know, you know, engage me. And he says, what, you know. And then he, he realized I wanted to keep it on hold because James Brown talking about Viagra is something you want on the show. So we get done with commercials. And we come back on the air, and Howard says, uh, so James was, Robin, uh, James was uh, talking about uh, Viagra. And he said, and he says, yeah, Howard, Howard, did you ever try that Viagra? And Howard said, no, because he hadn't, and none of us had. It was pretty, pretty brand new at, the, at this point. He said, that Viagra, Howard? I'm, and at this point, I'm guessing he was 70. He might have been 65. He might have been 75. But he was James Brown with the jet black hair. Who the hell could tell? He says, Howard? I took them Viagra, and Howard, I had me an appointment. And you know what, Howard? <laughs> 20, 20 minutes later, I had me another appointment. <laughs> and I never heard it put like that before. And I was, we were howling, howling. And then, and then we played a song with James Brown. We played Papa's Got a Brand New Bag or something like that. And it was amazing. And... Howard didn't want to ask him to play. And I kept saying, ask him, ask him. And finally, at the end of the interview, he says, listen, James, we have a band. Do you want to play with us? Yeah, yeah. And James Brown got up, and not only did he sing with us, but when we got done with the song, he actually turned around like a kid in a garage with a garage band and said, you guys know any blues? He would. I'm telling you, we'd still be there playing if he had had his way. He was just, uh, there's a James Brown thing on, on PBS that's, Unbelievable! I don't. It's called the the formulation of James Brown or the the birth of James Brown, but it's his whole career and that old footage from like the early '60s. You know that whole thing about the hardest working man in show business. You have no idea that guy was. He was phenomenal. He, by all by all, uh, 
you know, everybody says he never paid anybody and he's such a prick. He'd like in the middle of a show, he'd be like this, and he'd turn around and go like this. And that'd be him fining the drummer $10 for missing a beat. I mean, literally. But it, it, it was so great. And I don't know why we're talking about, oh, we had a James Brown note. Yeah. Oh, you know what? That was, that was him doing the promo for the show. Hello, I'm James Brown. It's the Howard Stern's world. Like, it's man's world. It's Howard Stern's world. I feel good when I'm here. All right, that's all. And he signed it. And you got another on. gentleman on the phone there? Do I do this? Let's see. John in Philly. I love Philadelphia. Of course, I almost got divorced because of Philadelphia, because that's where we climbed in the bathtub with Jessica Hahn, and then he put Fred in the bathtub in the movie. Oh, that was that wasn't you. That was you. In real life, it was me. Oh shit! I didn't know that. You never heard the apology? No, I guess I didn't. I wasn't a Stern fan. <clears throat> I was an O and A fan. It's, it's such a long story. It's like, that's the only chapter in my book that's three chapters. All right, well, why don't we take this call first and then we'll... No, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, no, I don't want to tell that story. The whole world knows that, but I... <laughs> me and Howard got in the bathtub with Jessica Hahn. And in the movie, Fred and Howard got in the bathtub with Linda Blair. So I almost got divorced, <laughs> and then I didn't get to be in the scene. But ho- I'm sorry, John. I'm sorry. How are you doing? I love Philadelphia, dude. It's all right, man. How are you? Very, very good. I go. I was killing in Philadelphia before years before I was on the Stern Show, the Comedy Factory Outlet, Bananas, the Comedy Works. There was a place in Philadelphia called the Comedy Works, where you walked up stairs and went on stage from behind the stage. But if you had to take a leak, you had to go back down the stairs behind the stage and had to walk through the Middle East restaurant and in front of the belly dancer. And I'm not making yep. that up. You had to walk past the belly dancer to take a leak. You could not make that up. That's a true story. Sorry, John. I saw, I saw crazy Lenny Schultz in that place. Oh, he, you know what? He's still a dear, dear friend of mine, that crazy man. I he see was him. out of his mind. <clears throat> yeah, he used to go out. They, it's closed now, but there was a place called the New York Comedy Club in Boca Raton. <clears throat> and Lenny was like 75, and he'd come on stage still, and, you know, juggle water and uh, be the bionic chicken. He was just a, he's just a pisser, isn't he? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. I mean, it, it, it was it was prop comedy, which is sometimes you know sometimes people consider that hack, but he he didn't do it hack because he had weird shit. He was absolutely he he literally was crazy. So it didn't matter what he was holding or wasn't holding, you know. Blow up dolls and hacks and <sighs> you know a can, a can of uh, burl cream. <laughs> I, you know, he used to he used to blast uh, the song "You Light Up My Life" and hold up an eight by ten of Debbie Boone. And light it on fire. <laughs> I don't know why that was so funny, but it, and he'd make that face, you know. Oh God! So how you doing, buddy? Pretty good, man. It's good to hear you on the uh, on the channel here. I, I, you know what? I'm I'm ecstatic. These guys are great. They've been nice to me. God knows what they, you know. I should pull a Jerry Lewis. You know, Jerry Lewis used to bring a a briefcase and he'd put on a tape recorder and he'd leave the briefcase and leave the meeting, and then he'd come back and he'd be able to listen back and hear what people said about him after he left, which is the, just the lowest fucking thing I've ever heard of. But you know, I want to be flying the wall and say, oh, I'm glad fucking Jackie's gone, you know. But how you doing? That's, that's great. I'm doing great, man. I want to play Stump the Joke, man. Well, you're not going to win. I think I may have got this from you 20 years ago. <laughs> a girl, I was at a Christmas party, Hank and Celeste. Uh, Pinkerton, nicest people in the world, and this very pretty woman comes over to me and she says, "Can I play stump the joke, man?" And I'm like, "All right, I'm going to be polite, you know." And I said, "Sure." And she told me a great, great new joke, and it's a Santa Claus joke. Why did Santa Claus send his daughter to college? He wanted to get her off the pole. <laughs> <laughs> What a great joke! I'm like, holy Christmas, lady! And I had to go home and get her a T-shirt and everything. All right, let's hear you stump the joke, man. All right, what what has six legs and yells, "Hody do, hody do, hody do"? All right, I'm going to tell you something. We started comedy at uh, at Cinnamon in Huntington. Do we got that nine two two wine sticker there, uh, yes. Ratman? And uh, I started this joke line five one six nine two two wine. <laughs> In 1979, to promote the show that we were doing at Cinnamon and Huntington, uh, and 9221, people call and hear a dirty joke, and then hear where we're doing the show, and then they hear another dirty joke, 
which is still operating right now. If you dial 516-922-9463, you'll hear me telling jokes. I tell that the Monica Lewinsky joke. Did you see the Monica Lewinsky joke I was sending around? They asked Monica Lewinsky if Bill Cosby mm-hmm. was as disgusting as Bill Clinton, and she said, close, but no cigar. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a great joke. But meanwhile, at Cinnamon, we used to do shows, and Eddie Murphy was there. And I told Eddie Murphy the joke that you just tried to stump me with. And the next week, gotcha. he told it on Saturday Night Live. What has, what has six legs and goes, ho do ho do ho do That's three black guys running to catch an elevator, <laughs> which, is, which is just a beauty. It's a, such that's a stupid— That's always been one of my favorites. Such a fun joke. And he told—I mean, that's not my joke. You know, you know me. I'm just a conduit. I just repeat this stuff. But, uh, but he told that on Saturday Night Live, which was cool. I only, got, I only had one thing in all these years. The only thing I ever had on Saturday Night Live was an idea that I gave to uh, Norm McDonald. Who do used to do? Who was the guy with the with who held the pencil? Oh, Bob, Bob Dole. Dole. Bob Dole was his, was his arm paralyzed or something like that or whatever yeah, it was. And- so he always had a pen or or pencil in his hand. So uh, Norm Macdonald said he was going to do a thing where he's Bob Dole and where he, he trips and falls off the podium. And I said it'd be really hysterical if when you came back up on the podium, if the pen was st- sticking out of your hair and he did it and it brought the house down. That was my only contribution to Saturday Night Live. So, Lorne Michaels, please send me 45 cents. <laughs> That's a beauty. He's a funny guy. All right, guy. Jackie, thanks, man. Thank you, dude. Listen, I'm Good coming to, to Philadelphia. To you. you know what? Those people at Helium refused to hire me. It's funny, it's owned by two brothers, and one brother really loves me, and he's a huge fan, and the other guy hates me, and I don't know whether I banged his mother or his cousin or his wife, or, you know, but he hates me, and that's supposed to be one of the great clubs, one of the great, great clubs, but what can you do, you know? So I'm stuck at the Parks Casino. You know what, okay. I'll tell you where I've sunk to. Now, I'm, I, got, I just got a gig, me and Bobby Slayton and Stuttering John, Super Bowl weekend at the South Point Casino in Las Vegas. It's like the big time again. Here I am. I'm on the bill with Slayton at the South Point Casino. Super Bowl weekend. Such a big thing. A couple weeks ago, I worked this place, Park Casino. It's a casino. And the stage and the, and the performance area is kind of surrounded by a curtain. So, of course, you hear ding, 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 ching, ching, ding, ding, ding. You know, it's kind of faint. But you can hear it better than the audience can because the curtain's right behind you. But the first time I worked, <laughs> meanwhile, I've worked there five times, you know, the, it, it's as horrible as it is, you know, take the money and run. But I'm on stage and I'm like, what have I sunk to? Ding, 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 ding. What could possibly be worse? What could be lower than this? And I swear on my mother, all of a sudden I hear, B6. Oh, they're, t- they're calling freaking bingo behind me. I was, I was like, all right, all right, Jack, you know. I'm still glad I quit that show. I'm getting the rap sign. I have run out of steam. That's And I'm Thinking About You. That is my theme song. I wrote that song eight or nine years ago. That's Frank Vignola playing the guitar. Frank Vignola and Vinnie Raniolo. I am Jackie Martling. This is Jokeland from the compound. Thanks tons and tons and tons to Stinky I'm and Rat and Officer Keith and, of course, thing Anthony, thing the famous I'm Anthony Cumia. If you want a joke every day at 4.20 p.m. at Jackie Martling, J-A-C-K-I-E-M-A-R-T-L-I-N-G, Dirty Jokes, 516-922-WINE. Jokeland.com says where I'm working. I hope to see you again on these airwaves and on these view waves, whatever they are. This is the most fun I've ever had without using my penis. I'm driving along, driving along. I'm singing a song, singing a song. And I got my dick out, got my dick out. I'm thinking about you, thinking about you.